Welcome to Learn It Training. The exercise files for today's course are located in the video description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome to Excel for HR. You're learning with Mo Jones, IT professional and educator. If you're an HR professional, then this course is made just for you. Here's what we'll explore today for module one. We'll take a look at text functions. How can we use text functions to clean up or improve our data set? We'll take a look at formulas. We'll also use some really useful functions. We'll also take a look at charts. And then finally, we'll take a look at how we can use a three-dimensional tool to consolidate different worksheets into one. Go ahead and grab the practice file. Make sure to download it and open it and come right back and we'll dive right in. Looking to support our channel and get a great deal? Become a member today to unlock ad-free videos. That's right, your favorite courses without a single ad. Interested in a specific video? Purchase one of our ad-free courses individually. Looking for even more? Gain access to exams, certificates, and exclusive content at learnitanytime.com. More information can be found in the video description below. I just opened up my practice file. Now, as we can see, we have several worksheets here on the bottom. So the very first one is text functions. And we'll learn about the text to columns feature. We'll take a look at flash fill. And we'll also take a look at the today function. Then we'll move on over to formulas, functions, XLOOKUP, inserting charts, and then we'll take a look at a consolidation tool that will consolidate all three of these reports into one cohesive report. On the very first worksheet tab here is text functions. So here is our sample HR data set. We have the employee number, the name, the location, the hire date, the pay rate, and the hours as well. So the first thing we would like to do is sometimes when data is exported from one system to the next, the data does not always come out the way that you expect it to. So in this case, we were expecting the first name and the last name to be in two separate columns. We can see that's not the case here. They're both in one column in column B. So we'll take a look at a tool that we can use to export the first name and the last name from column B into column C and column D. The first tool we'll take a look at is on the data tab. So if you click on the data tab and we head on over to the data tools command group, we have a tool called text to columns. That's what we want to use. If I just move my mouse over it, it tells me exactly what it does. Split a single column of text into multiple columns. So the first step is to choose the data that I want to extract or split into different columns here. I can either choose all of these names or I can just do it one by one. I'm actually gonna go ahead and choose all of them. So I'll highlight all of my names here. And then I'll go ahead and run my text to columns tool. It's a three-step wizard. This is step one of three. It's just asking us, how can we describe our data? Do we have characters such as commas or tabs or spaces? Most of the time we'll choose this option. For fixed width, this allows you to basically align the columns wherever you want to. We'll take advantage of the spaces that are in here to split the actual column. I'll go ahead and press next. Now, if I take a look at my data set here, here's a preview of what the output would look like. We can see they're still in one cell here. Now, I don't have any commas in here. I don't have any semicolons. But as soon as I click on the space here, I can see that it's inserting a column where there is a space. Now, I can actually scroll through my records here to make sure everything looks OK. I'll go ahead and click on Next. And so here's the output. The only thing I need to do now is change the location. So where do I want to place the results? I want to place it here in the first available cell in column C, which is C2. We've completed step three. I'll go ahead and press finish, and let's see what happens here. 
tells me that there's data there, just some formatting. It's okay. I'll just go ahead and press okay. And there we go. We've extracted or split those names into two columns. So here's Edwin and then Johnson. If I scroll down, I'll do a quick test here. I'll go to the last record. Here is Ernie Chandler. So that is the text to column tool. So remember, you can either do one at a time or you can do a mass export as well. Let's continue working with this data set. In column F, I want to use a tool called Flash Fill to extract the state from the actual location. So again, this is bad data. We have the city and the state in one column. Now we can go ahead and extract the state so that we can have more reporting capabilities. So to do that, I can use Flash Fill. Now Flash Fill works several ways. Flash Fill can be found in the Data Tools command group as well. And it's this little icon here that has a little lightning bolt going through a table. That is Flash Fill. So I can either run Flash Fill manually. I can also use the shortcut Control E to run Flash Fill, or I can go ahead and just allow Excel to pick up on a pattern and complete the pattern for me. So I want to go ahead and extract the state from column E. So the first one is New Mexico. So I'll go ahead and type NM. And let's see if Excel will pick up on the pattern for me. I'll start typing T for Texas. And look at that. So notice how it's offering to extract, extract the remaining states for me. So it already picked up on the pattern. So Flash Fill looks to the left of your data. It senses a pattern. Once it finds the pattern, it will offer to automatically fill that pattern for you. Or if it doesn't work, you can go ahead and on a blank cell, you can run Flash Fill or you can use the shortcut to run Flash Fill as well. I'm gonna go ahead and press Enter to accept all of those. Now I'll give it a quick test. So I'll press the Enter key. So you can see it's extracting all of those states for me. As soon as you run Flash Fill, you receive a Flash Fills option box here. And I can either undo the Flash Fill, I can accept the suggestions if it got everything right, or I can select all of these cells here. I'm going to undo the Flash Fill because I want to go ahead and run this manually. So I've extracted the first two states here on the next blank cell here. I'll go ahead and run Flash Fill manually. As we can see, it picked up on the pattern here as well. So Flash Fill looks to the left for a pattern. Once it senses the pattern, it will offer it for you. If it does not pick up on the pattern right away, you'll get a message that says we looked at the data next to your selection and did not see a pattern. Just need to enter a couple of more examples and run Flash Fill again until it picks up on the pattern for you. Sometimes when you run Flash Fill, um, depending on what you're trying to do, and you'll be surprised to see what type of patterns Flash Fill can actually recognize and recreate for you. You may need to retrain. So if the output is not correct, you can just make the correction in the cell and it will retrain the flash fill to update the pattern and apply it there as well. So that is flash fill. Our data set is looking pretty good so far. We've extracted the first and last name. We've extracted the state here as well. Now let's go ahead and calculate the length of service. Now the length of service, we do have the higher date here. So what we can do is because dates are actually stored as numerical values in Excel, we can perform calculations on a particular date. So for example, let's say I want to add, you know, three years to this date. I can type in the cell and I can say something like equals this date plus, let's just do 30 days. And it gives me the new date. So 30 days from December 2nd, 2020 brings me to January 1st of 2021. Well, what we want to do is we want to perform a calculation. So if we want to perform a calculation, we need to use the equal sign. So if I type the equal sign in here, I'm letting Excel know that I want to perform a particular calculation. 
So what I would like to do is my calculation is going to subtract the current date minus the higher date. And that will give me the number of days of service. So this will be the length of service in terms of days. But I need a way to always have today's date. So for that, I'm going to use a function that's called today. Today will always give you the current date for that particular day. So if I click in here and I just simply enter the today function, I'll say equal today. There's the today function. So it returns the current date formatted as a date. I'll go ahead and open my parentheses, and close my parentheses to activate the function. And there you go. So it always gives us the current date. As you can see, I have it here in cell M2, a simple today function gives us the date. So now what I can do, I already have what I need. I have the current date and I have the higher date. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and perform a calculation. I'll go ahead and calculate the first length of service here. So it equals the current date which is in cell M2 minus the higher date, which is in cell G2. So what is the amount of days between these two dates? I'll go ahead and press the enter key. And it gives me 1,268.8 days. Right. So that's fine, but I'll go ahead and convert this to a whole number. I'll click on the home tab and I'll remove the decimal there. So it rounds it up to 1,269 as well. So now what I can do, I can go ahead and autofill that pattern down. But if I autofill down, it's going to move away from the, from the cell M2. It's going to keep going down. So I'm going to absolute reference cell M, M2. To do that, I'll go back to the original formula here. And here's cell M2. I'll press the F4 key on my keyboard. And that absolute references that cell for me. So notice dollar sign M, dollar sign 2. That's telling Excel to lock on to column M and lock on to row 2. In the end, it's cell M2. So I've made the correction for that form for that formula. I'll go ahead and press enter. And now I can go ahead and grab the fill handle. It's a little square here on the bottom right of every cell. I'll go ahead and drag that down. And it's going to calculate the length of service for me. So I'll go ahead and grab this and I'll pull it down. And there we go. So here are all of the length of service for each of my employees here as well. Let's head on over to our formulas tab. We have an extension of our existing data set here. We want to go ahead and calculate the gross pay. We'll also calculate the amount of time off remaining. So each employee has 20 days. So we'll go ahead and calculate the amount of days remaining based on the amount of time that's already used. And then we'll see how we can use a really nice tool to quickly enter data into this data set by using a form. So the first calculation here that I'll make is the gross pay. Now remember, to start a calculation, we need to use the equal sign. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and it's going to be the pay rate multiplied by the hours. So the pay rate is expressed here in cell E2, and the hours is expressed in cell F2. So therefore, my formula is going to be equals E2 times F2. So that will give me my answer. Once I get that, I can go ahead and autofill down this calculation here as well. Now there's different operators 
So for addition, we have the plus sign. For subtraction, we have the minus sign. Multiplication, we have the asterisk. And for division, we have the forward slash. So these are the four basic mathematical operators. I'll go ahead and enter my pay, my gross pay. So I'll click on cell G2. I'll type the equal sign and I'll use the cell reference. So I can click on the cell. So it puts the name of the cell for me, which is E2. I'll type my asterisk and I can either type the name of the cell, which is F2, or I can click on it. So either one works either way. My formula is E2 times F2. I'll go ahead and press the enter key. So there's my first answer. So for Edwin Johnson, 2658 per hour times 25 hours for the, the work week comes out to that amount. Now I can go ahead and autofill down. Because I actually have data to the left, I can actually just double click on my fill handle here and it will automatically fill down for me as well. So you can either pull it down manually or if you double click on it, as long as you have data to the left, it will fill down for you. So there are my gross pays. Let's go ahead and calculate the amount of days remaining. So for this one, it's going to be the days allotted so the minus the days used. Cell references for those, we have, looks like K2 and H2. So therefore my formula is going to equal K2 minus H2. Now this number is fixed, so we need to actually absolute reference this cell here as well. So it's going to be dollar sign K. It's going to be dollar sign K, dollar sign two. And we're good to go. Let's go ahead and autofill down without absolute referencing that cell. And let's see what happens. So I'll go ahead and enter my calculation in here. So equals K2 minus H2. So it should give me 18. 20 minus two is 18. And there you go. Now look what happens if I autofill down. Just a quick tidbit on absolute referencing here. So I get some weird numbers. I know that 20 minus 18 is not minus 18. I know that 20 minus four is not minus four. When you enter calculations, if you want to take a look at the formula, just double click on the cell and we can see what's happening here. It's supposed to be, so this is correct. We have the correct cell, right? So the days used on row three, but we don't want this. We don't want K3. We want to remain on K2. So every row is going to keep moving away from that number. So we need to absolute reference it. We already know how to do that. I'll click on the first formula here. And I'll go ahead and absolute reference my K2. I'll press F4 on my keyboard and I'm good to go. Now I'll go ahead and press enter. And if I auto fill down, this shows me the days remaining for all of my employees here as well. So we're good to go. I'll just go ahead and center this text. So those are two calculations that can help us to answer some questions on our data set. Now, scrolling through records and entering data in an Excel worksheet can be a pretty daunting task sometimes, especially if you have a lot of records. So it would be nice if we can just have a nice condensed form that we can use where we can kind of just scroll through our records, some buttons that we can use to maybe scroll through records, find a record, delete a record, or even add a new record. And over here on the left, we'll have all those fields displayed with the actual information. Well, in the past, we had to use VBA and spend hours 
designing and programming and coding an actual form. But we can actually insert a form that will automatically be created for us that will be tied to the data that's on this worksheet. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and add the form command to my quick access toolbar. So my quick access toolbar is up here. If I hover over it, I can click on it. And down towards the bottom, I have more commands. So I'll click on more commands. This will bring up my Excel options window. So here's my Excel options. I can see that I'm currently on the quick access toolbar pane here. As you can see, I just have a few items on my quick access toolbar. Well, I want to go ahead and add the form. So it's most likely not going to show in this short list here. So I'll change it from popular commands to all commands. Here's the all commands here. Once the list refreshes, here are all the commands that are available. I want the form, so I'll type the letter F. So that brings me down to the F section here. So I'll scroll down and look for the form icon. And here it is right here. I'll go ahead and add that to my quick access toolbar. And I'm good to go. I'll go ahead and press OK. So now here is my form. And now I can use that form on any data set now that I have. So if I wanted to add another record in here, or maybe just modify a record, I can do that. I'll click inside of my data set, and I'll click on the form here. And look at that. So it pops up the form right away. It shows all the fields for the form, employee number, name, location, hire date, pay rate, hours. If a field is a calculation, it just shows the data. You cannot enter the data there. That makes sense. So what if I wanted to make a change here for Edwin Johnson? Let's say Edwin Johnson has used eight days. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And we can see that that record updated automatically here. So Edwin now has eight, now has 12 days remaining as well. So it's showing me the record that I'm currently on. I can go ahead and Go to the next. So if I click on find next here, it goes to my third record, which is Wade Maynard. And I can keep on going. Now, if I want to, I can delete a record and I can also add a new record. I'm going to go ahead and quickly add a new record here and let's see how that works. So I'll click on new and I'll just put in a number in here. I'll just put in 1001. And just put some data in here. So here's my record. I'll go ahead and press the Enter key. And let's see. I'll go ahead and close my form here. And let's go down to the end of the data set. And here's my record. So pretty, pretty cool. To get the form back, I just need to click on the data set again. And I can open the form. And so this is, uh, we have some nice options in here as well. Feel free to click on the question mark here on the top of the form and just be on the lookout for any new features that are available and we're good to go. Let's take it a step higher. We've used some basic calculations. We've used one function so far, which is the today function. But let's take a look at how we can use some more conditional functions to return values from a data set. In this case, we'll take a look at some conditional functions. So we have, this is a professional development kind of worksheet here. So we have the type of program that was taken by a particular employee from a particular department and the actual cost. So Brandy Turner completed the leadership program and the total cost was $24.85.54. On row 10, Christina Hubbard completed the computer skills program from the accounting department in the amount of $21.95.62. So we want to create a little kind of a little dashboard here that we can answer some questions. Like if we enter an employee in here, 
we can count the amount of programs that the employee, employee completed. We can also answer another question. So based on the employee, what were the total costs for the programs taken by that employee? What were the total costs for programs based on department? And also, what is the average cost for an actual program? So I'll go ahead and get this set up here. But before we do that, let's just take a look at the simple if statement. So the if function, basically it checks to see if a condition is true. If the condition is true, we can just simply return true, or we can perform a calculation, or we can provide some custom text. Or if it's false, we can say false or do something else as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and place some values here. So I'll put one value in here. I'll put, uh, let's say, 1,500. And then in the other cell, I'll put 2,000. Okay. So 1,500, let's say this is the, this is the sale. And for 2,000, this is the actual goal. So we just want to write a simple if statement. So basically, if the sale is greater than the goal, then we'll just say true. If it's not greater than the goal, then we'll say false. So I'll go ahead and click on the formulas tab here, and I'll go ahead and insert a function. At the top, I'll look for my if function, and I'll press go. Here's the if function. I'll go ahead and press OK. So welcome to the function arguments box for the if function. The function arguments box tells us the name of the function, what the function does, and here are the three arguments that it's asking for. So the first part of the if statement is the logical test. Well, a logical test is, we want to focus on the cell reference, is the cell value, is it greater than or equal to the goal? which is right here. So to express that, my logical test is I'm concerned about the sale, which is in K5. Is that greater than or equal to the goal, which is in cell K6? Excel has already evaluated that statement for us. It's telling us that that is false because 1500 is less than 2000, not greater than or equal to. So if it's true, in quotes, I'll just say yes. And here I'll say no. So the result is going to be no, because we've already tested that condition. It's determined that it's false. So therefore, the answer is no. I'll go ahead and press OK. And there we go. Now, if I change this value, let's say the next time, the next instance, this is 2100 we can see that the answer changes to yes here. So that is the basic if function. And that is the foundation for the other functions here that we'll be using to answer these different questions, such as the count if function, the sum if function, and the average if function. Let's go ahead and answer this question. I'll go ahead and expand this column here. And I'll type an employee in here. And I'll go for Sean Tate. So I'll type Sean's name in here. So let's see if we can find out how many programs Sean Tate completed. So to do that, we'll use what's called the COUNTIF function. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to count the amount of times that Sean Tate appears under the employee column, right? So if we did this manually, we can see one here. And I only see one so far, maybe there's more than one in there. That's okay, we can change it later. So as you can see, trying to do this manually is a little frustrating, especially if you have a large data set. So the count of function will take care of that for us. I'll go ahead and insert the COUNTIF function. So I'll click on the Formulas tab, and I'll click on the Insert function here. 
we could type the function in the cell like this, but if this is your first time using functions, it's best to use the function arguments box. So I'll go ahead and insert the countif function here. I'll press go and I'll press OK. So it counts the number of cells within a range that meets the given condition. So the first part here is the range. So my range is going to be my employee column. So all of my data underneath the employee column should be C2 to C51, I believe. The next part of this is the criteria. So the criteria is the employee. I can type the name in here, but we know better than that. We want to use the cell reference. So this way now we can type a name in here and get an instant answer. So I'll go ahead and highlight that range. So C2 to C51. I just used the shortcut Control Shift Down to highlight all of those values. I did not feel like scrolling through here. So that's the first part. We have the range. Now the criteria is right there in G2. Here's a little preview of the range. So here's Brandy Turner, Roxanne Rollins, and then Bob Harvey. Right. We can see G2 has Sean Tate in there. So Sean has completed one program. I'll go ahead and press OK. And there is our first answer. Well, let's go ahead and change this. So for the employee, I'll go ahead and type Candace. Seems like Candace has completed a few programs here. So Candace Kimball. And there we go. So Candace has completed two courses. So now we can just enter an employee that exists on the list and we can get the amount of programs that were taken as well. So that is the countif function. It's going to ask us basically for the range. It also asks for the criteria. As a matter of fact, all of these are going to ask us for the same thing. What is the range? What is the criteria? The difference is for the sum if and the average if, it's going to ask us which column we will want to provide the calculation on as well. Let's go ahead and grab the total cost here for Candace Kimball. So I'll go ahead and add Candace here in the cell. So here's Candace. Now what I want to do is grab the total cost. We know that Cam Candace completed two programs. What is the total cost for those two programs? Well, I could go ahead and kind of add this number here plus this number here as well. And I can pretty much do that. I can see the data right here. So it's a simple calculation. But what if, you know, this was 5,000 rows of data and Candace completed six programs? I would need to do a lot of filtering to try and get that number. So I just want to simply enter the name in here and grab the total cost. Now, it's going to ask us the same thing. It's going to ask for the range and the criteria. It's also going to ask us for the math column. So which column do we want to perform the math on? So the, for this one, we'll use what's called the sum if function. What's the range? What's the criteria? And what's the math column? Well, the range is going to be the employee column. That's the range. The criteria, well, it's going to be whatever is in the cell. We currently have Candace Kimball in there. And then finally, the last part here is the math column. We want to summarize the amount in the cost column, which is column D. So we have everything that we need. We're going to go ahead and plug in those ranges and we'll be good to go. So I'll go ahead and add my sum if function here. And here we go. What's the range? My employee column. What am I looking for? I'm looking for Candace Kimball, which is currently in cell G5. And then the math column. I want to summarize the match that's found in column D. So I'll highlight all of column D. And there we go. 
So we found the two matches here for Candace Kimball on row eight. Here's the matching cost in column D. The other one here is on row 22, and there's the matching cost. Add these two numbers together, and it gives us our 418207. I'll go ahead and press OK, and I'm good to go. So that's how these functions work. Range, criteria, if you're summarizing or doing some type of math, we need to specify the math column as well. I'll go ahead and change this to Omar Matthews. Okay, so Omar Matthews, total cost for programs, 2,097 and 33. Now, so far, we've been highlighting the range. We've been working with the employee range, and we find ourselves highlighting the range each time. But what we can actually do is we can actually name the range. So the next time we're entering our formula or our function, instead of highlighting, we can just type the name of the actual range. For example, I want to perform some math on the cost column here. I'm going to highlight all of those costs. So I can see I have D2 to D51 highlighted here. Well, right here in the name box, I want to go ahead and give that a name. So right here in the name box, I'll just type cost. So let's see what happens when I do that. I'll click in the name box. Instead of D2, I'll type cost in here, and I'll press the Enter key. Now, if I click on an empty cell, I'll click on the drop down here and I can see that I have a named range in here called cost. If I click on there, it highlights the range for me. So now basically what I've done is that whenever I refer to cost, it's basically referring to this worksheet, right? So this is the functions worksheet and the, the range D2 to D51. So why is that a big deal? Well, now what I can do, what if I want the, the total cost? Well, now I can enter the sum function. So I'm going to say equal the sum of, I don't have to highlight that range. I'll type the name in there. So C O S. T. Here's the name range that Excel has saved into memory for me that I can refer to by name. So what is the sum of the cost range? I'll go ahead and press enter. And here's my answer. I'll just convert that to the accounting format so I can read it. So total training, 91,911.52. Right. Now what about the average? What is the average cost? So this time I'll use the average function. My range is the cost range. So same thing here. I'll give this the accounting format. So the average per program is 1838.23. So we can see how that can help us when we are using our ranges here. So I am going to go ahead and name the employee range, the department range, and the program range. I'll start with the programs. So I'll go ahead and highlight all of my program range, A2 to A51, and I'll just call this program. Now for department, I'll do the same thing. I'll highlight all of my departments, and I'll go ahead and call this department. Finally, for my employee, I'll highlight all of my employees as well. I'll go ahead and call this employees. And there we go. 
So now if I click on the drop down here, I can see the, here are my four named ranges, cost, department, employee, and program. So I'm good to go. And by the way, I can even use these ranges throughout my entire workbook. So if I go to another, let's say another worksheet tab here, and I want to summarize that cost column, I can do that from another sheet as well. So that's how we name ranges in Excel. Let's go ahead and grab the total cost for training programs with the accounting department. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at the average cost per program. So I'll go ahead and change this. Actually, it should be average cost. So let's use the SUMIF function to summarize the total amount spent on training for the accounting department. So I'll go ahead and insert my function here again. Here's my SUMIF. I'll press OK. Now we have the range. The range is the department. So we can type department in here. Our criteria is whatever is in the cell. And then the sum range is going to be our cost. So we have all the data that we need here. Let's use the names. So for the range, it's the department. And here's the preview of the department range over here. So the criteria is it has to be accounting. And the last part here is going to be the sum range. So what is the math column? I want to summarize the cost column. So I'll type C-O-S-T and there's our answer. So we did not even need to interact with our data set here. We did not need to see the data set. We did not need to click on it. We can just refer to it by name. Here's our answer. $20,634.23. I'll go ahead and press OK. And there we go. Now I can change that and get an answer there as well. I'll change this to, to uh, HR. So HR spent $16,462.61 on training programs for their staff. I'll do one more. This time we'll use the average if function to find out what is the average cost per program. For the program, I'll choose leadership. And we'll use the average if function for this one. We'll refer to the ranges. So the range is going to be the program range. The criteria is going to be whatever is in the cell, which is currently leadership. And we want to perform the math on the cost column. So I'll go ahead and insert my average if. It's already on my list down here on the bottom. So I'll click OK. So I'm good to go. The range is program. We can see it appears here. If we typed it incorrectly, it will not show up here. My criteria is it needs to be leadership. We want to perform the math on the cost column. And there we go, we have our answer. So we just put the range in and we're getting our answer. So the average is $1,960.48. I'll go ahead and press OK. And now we're good to go. So we have a fully functional little dashboard here that we can use to just enter some inputs in column G and get the corresponding output in column H as well. So feel free to change these values to get some real-time results here as well. Let's head on over to XLOOKUP here. Now XLOOKUP is a really nice lookup function. So in this case, what I would like to do is set up a little kiosk. I want to be able to enter an employee number and Based on the employee number, I want to return the name of the employee, the hire date, 
their length of service and maybe their pay rates as well. So this will give me a little, again, just like we did before, a little dashboard that we can use to return values from another data set. So now that we have some more detail here for our very first worksheet, the text functions. So here's the employee number, we have the name, we have the hire date, and we have the length of service as well. So the way the XLOOKUP works is we need to go ahead and input the employee number. So for example, let's say I input employee number 788. What XLOOKUP will do is going to search this column once it finds the record with employee number 788, well, then what I can do is go ahead and return any field. So I can return the name field. I can return the corresponding hire date, length of service, and the pay rate as well. So that's pretty much how XLOOKUP works. So let's get some practice. I'll go ahead and create the first one here. So we can either have the kiosk here on the same worksheet as the data set, or it can be on another worksheet. So I'll go ahead and put an employee number in here. I'll go with the 788. So this is going to be my input. So the input is the employee number and the output. We want to output the name, hire date, length of service, and the pay rate as well. Let's write our first XLOOKUP statement. Let's take a look at the function. Let's see what it asks for. And then we'll keep it simple and then we'll see how we can be more efficient with returning the hire date, length of service, and the pay rate. So I'll go ahead and insert my XLOOKUP function here. I already have it here, so I'll go ahead and press OK. So it asks for three things. What is the lookup value? Well, a lookup value is going to be the employee number 788 in this case. So this should be whatever is in cell A2, which currently has 788 in there. The next part here for the lookup array, this is basically asking us where can we find right? So where can we find the employee numbers? That's pretty much what it's asking us. The last part here, the return array. Well, this is basically asking us to choose a field to return. And that's it. So we already have all the information. We just need to highlight the cells and ranges and XLOOKUP will take care of the rest for us. So let's do this. I'll go ahead and click on cell a2, which has 788 in there. Now remember the lookup array is where can I find those employee numbers? So which column has that 788? Well, I can click on the sheet here and I'll go ahead and highlight all of my employee numbers. So here's the array, 731, 781, 771. Now that I'm here, I'll move this over. Well, what do I want to return? Well, I want to return the name. So I'll highlight all of my names here. Okay. So based on the ID 788, we can see that the matching name for that record is Marcus Abbott. So basically what we did, we took that employee number we went down this column here and we returned the actual name from here as well. So that is how XLOOKUP works. Now to make things more efficient, we can name these ranges, the employee number range, the name range, the hire date range, and the length of service. So this way we can just type the name of the range in here as opposed to having to navigate back over here as well. So I'll go ahead and name those ranges, and then we'll write our other XLOOKUP functions. So I'll go ahead and highlight all of my employee numbers. I'll just call this mpnum. 
And for all of my names, I'll just call that name. Here are my hire dates. Just call it hire date, one word. And length of service, I'll just call that LOS. And I'm good to go. So go ahead and name those ranges, and we'll come back and we'll write our other XLOOKUP functions by using the name of the range. I'll go ahead and return the hire date from Mark Abbott with employee number 788. So I'll go ahead and insert my XLOOKUP function here. Now remember, the lookup value is always going to be cell A2. We need to enter a value in here to search the database. Now the lookup array, this is going to be the employee num. Now, if we forgot the name that we used, if we take a look here on the formulas tab in the define names command group, we can click on this dropdown and this will show us all the names, all the named ranges that we have. And we can choose a name from the dropdown. So I'll click on the dropdown here and it was the employee number. So I'll choose this range. We can see it's locking on to that range that is on the text functions worksheet tab. Now, as far as the return array, I want to return the name and I call that name, All right? But that's not what I want, I want the higher date. So I'll click on the drop down here. Here is higher date. So here's the serial value for the higher date. I'll go ahead and press OK. And I just need to convert this to a date format. So I'll right click on it. I'll click on format cells. And I'll choose the, I'll go with the short date format here. So there we go. So two XLOOKUP statements returning the name and the higher date. Just going to go ahead and give this a little bit of style. So I'll use some of these cell styles here. And I'll give these the output cell style. There we go. It looks a little better. We'll go ahead and clean things up a little bit. We'll zoom in. Okay, so let's put another number in here and give it a quick test. Let's go for 751. Let's see if we get Ralph Dunbar, 632.16. So let's put 751 in there. And there we go, Ralph Dunbar, 630.16. I'll go ahead and write uh, two more here, one for the length of service. So formulas, X lookup. Lookup value again is always going to be A2. Lookup array, I want the employee numbers, the return array, I want the length of service. So what did I call that here? LOS, and I'm good to go. Now there's two other options down here. You'll notice that they're not bold like the rest here. This just allows us to enter an input message if an ID is entered that does not belong. We'll take a look at that next here. I'll go ahead and press OK. Here's the length of service. Now I can just go ahead and remove the decimals to get a whole number, and we're good to go. Let's do one more. Before I do that, I'll go ahead and enter a number that's not on the database. I'll put 999. So as you can see, we're getting an NA error because that number does not exist. Right? A value is not available for this function. So that message does not make sense. So what we can do is we can customize the message that appears if the value that's entered is not found. We'll do that for the last one here. I'll insert my formula for the pay rate. So again, sometimes you just need to pause. Okay, the lookup value is A2, the lookup array, my employee numbers, the return array, I want to return the pay rate. 
So let's see. Did I put the pay rate in here? Nope, don't have the pay rate. That's okay. We can cancel this. I'll go ahead and, and add the pay rate here. So I'll name that as pay rate. Good to go. I'll come back now and, okay, so lookup value, lookup array is the employee number. We want to return the match from the pay rate column. And now I'll put my if not found in here. So if someone enters a value that's not on there, I'll just say no such ID or no such number, I'll go with no such ID. The other option here is the match mode. Now, we don't have to worry about this because by default, it searches for an exact match. So we're good to go. I'll go ahead and press OK. Here's my pay rate. I just need to go ahead and convert that to the accounting or currency format. So there's the record for Ralph Dunbar. Now, if I put it in a number that does not exist, 999, we can see that because we have the no if not found clause in here, it's giving us a custom statement, which is no such ID, as opposed to the NA that appears here as well. So we're good to go. I'll go ahead and just give this a quick test. Let's enter one more ID. Let's go for 777 there. 777, I'll press enter. There's Kelly Roy, 3981. Let's just confirm. Here's Kelly Roy, 3981. So that is XLOOKUP. Combining it with name ranges makes the process more efficient. Let's make use of the consolidation tool. The consolidation tool can be found on the data tab in the data tab, we have the data tools command group. We have a really small icon here, and that is the consolidation. If I move my mouse over it, it tells me exactly what it does. So it summarizes data from separate ranges. In this case, we have separate sheets. So for example, if you have a worksheet of expense figures for each of your regional offices, you might use a consolidation to roll up the figures into an expense worksheet. Well, that's what we want to do. We want to consolidate three worksheets into a single report with the consolidation tool. Here is the, here's our goal. We want to go ahead and merge the details from California, Washington, and Oregon into this sheet. So it's going to summarize all of our pro dev training expenses for all four quarters for all three of our regions as well. So if I were to click on California, we can see California has its own set of numbers here. For example, in quarter four, we spent $13,931.67 on software application training. In quarter three, for communication, we spent 96, 93, 96. If I go to Washington, same headers, program, quarter one, quarter two, three, and four, same labels as well, but each individual numbers. And then Oregon has their own number as well. So if I wanted to add all these numbers up at the end of the year, I would need to do something like this. So I would need to say equal quarter one for software applications for California plus quarter one for Washington plus quarter one for Oregon. And it gives me the answer, it's 39,278, but I have to click on those cells manually on each sheet to get that detail here. And now I'm gonna to have to do that quite a few more times to gather the rest of the details here as well. Well, thankfully we have the consolidation tool. So let's see how this works. I'm going to highlight the range. Now the key is we need to highlight the same range on each sheet. 
So this works best with some type of template right, or standard template that we can use. So I'll go ahead and highlight all of my headers. So A3 down to E8. I'm going to run the consolidation tool. Here is my dialog box. So in this case, I do want to summarize the data. So I'll leave that as the sum function here. Now I need to go ahead and add my references. So this up arrow here reminds us that we can select a range from a different sheet. So I'll click here and I'll click on California and I'm going to highlight the same range, A3 to E8. I'll go ahead and add that to the report. Now I'll move on over to Washington. Now when I moved over to Washington, notice how it's automatically highlighting the range for me. The nature of the tool, it assumes you want to summarize the same location on each sheet. I'll go ahead and add Washington. And then I'll click on Oregon just to make sure everything is selected. If it's not selected, you can just manually select it. I'll go ahead and click on Add. Now I do want to use the labels in the top row and the left column, so I'll go ahead and click here, and I'm good to go. If you want this to be dynamic, so if the numbers change, if you want the numbers to be updated automatically here, you can use the Create Links to Data Source option. It's just a little problematic because it creates some groupings and it kind of duplicates your numbers if you have any formalism here. Like I am on row 10, I'm summarizing it. I'll leave that turned off. Let's go ahead and press OK, and let's see what happens. So there we go. Remember our first calculation, we did it manually. and We get the same number here. So quarter one for all of our software applications across our three regions, the total is 39,278.82. So we're good to go. Now I have the totals down here, just a simple formula summing up the that column, and we're good to go. So that is how the consolidation tool works. Now the tool is also intuitive. So for example, I don't necessarily have to have these same labels here. I do need to have the same headers on all of my reports. But let's say on California, I did not have communication, but I had another type of program here. It would work properly. So it would um, include all of those unique labels here as well. So that is the consolidation tool. Now that we have our consolidated report, we can create a chart from here. Now here's my charts worksheet tab. Now, if I want to, I could add, I could insert my chart onto this worksheet, or I can add my chart here as well. Well, let's go ahead and add the chart for our consolidation worksheet. And once we add it, customize it, we can move it over to the charts worksheet tab here as well. So several different ways to insert a chart. This is some really important information. And so I like to create a nice visual from this data set. Now, if I click on the insert tab, we have what's called recommended charts. So over in the charts command group, I can be very specific. Maybe I want a pie chart or a, you know, a column chart or a bar chart, but I want to use what's called a recommended chart. So Excel is going to analyze my data for me and give me the chart that it thinks will fit best with my data here. As a matter of fact, if you just move your mouse over it, that's exactly what it does. So I want a recommended chart. I'll click here. And it's giving me the clustered bar chart. And as you can see, regardless of the chart that you choose, it is incorporating your data into that particular chart. I like this one. Here's the clustered column chart. So here are just some of the recommended ones that we can use. You can also use any chart. So if you click on all charts, here are different types of charts. So here's the 3D clustered column chart. There's a line chart. So lots of different charts that we can use. Just keep in mind some of these charts, they only display one series at a time. And so 
We just want to make sure that we're using one that's capturing the data that we want here as well. I'll go for the clustered column chart. It's a great chart because it allows you to display multiple series on a single chart, right? So in this particular one, the first cluster is the name of the program. And then we have the individual bars here indicating the quarter one, two, three, and four total cost for there as well. I'll go ahead and click OK. We can always change the chart later. And here is my chart. So we can see this chart. We can already understand the data. We have our legend down here. We have our vertical axis with the, the actual numbers. And on the horizontal axis, we have the names of the actual programs. We also have our chart title here, and we're good to go. Now we can customize the chart if we want to. As a matter of fact, once you select the chart, if you take a look at the chart design tab, there's a lot of things that we can do here. We can choose a chart style. We can already see that some of these will improve the look and feel of the chart. We can move the chart to another sheet. We can change the chart type. We can edit the data. We can switch the row and the column if we want to. And then there's a lot of other things that we can do. We can change the colors that are being displayed on the chart. We can add or remove some of the chart elements. And we have some preset layouts here that we can use. So a lot that we can do with our chart here. But I'll keep it simple. I'll make use of some of the quick layouts that are available. So I can click on my paintbrush right here. And this kind of gives me just some quick layouts here that I can use. So here's style number one, here's style number two. So you can see style number two, it adds the data labels, but they're in a vertical orientation, so they're not overlapping each other. Here's style number three. So it just kind of moved the legend to the top. We have a different gradient fill there. If I scroll down, and we can preview them before we actually choose it. Here's style number five. Here's style number six, that looks pretty nice and vibrant. Here's style number seven, just a gray background. Here's style number eight, so very modern, dark theme. So lots of different styles here that we can use. So you're gonna go ahead and choose the style that you want. I'm going to choose style number eight. So I'll go for the dark theme here. And then I can go ahead and give this a chart title. So I'll just go ahead and call this quarterly training cost. All right, so quarterly training cost. Now, even in here, I can actually modify the, the font, the color, and size, and so forth if I want to. Right. So that is how we insert a recommended chart. I'll go ahead and click on switch row and column, and let's see what it gives me. But first, here's how we read this chart. So the first cluster, the software applications. If I move my mouse over that first bar, here's the quarter one values for software applications, quarter two value, quarter three, and then quarter four. So everything is interactive. Just move your mouse over and you'll get a nice little tool tip here as well. I'll just go ahead and switch the row and column data and let's see what happens. Let's see if it makes sense. So in this case, we flip the data. And so now the first cluster is quarter one. In quarter one, here are our numbers for software applications, leadership, computer skills program, public speaking, and communications as well. So go ahead and insert your chart. Go ahead and take a look at some of the quick layouts that are available. You can even change the color here that's being provided on your chart. And we'll come right back. Now let's go ahead and manage the chart. So we can move the chart around. We can resize it to make it bigger. 
We can even change the chart type. So if I click back on the chart design tab here, I can change the chart type to something else. So if I want more of a 3D feel, I can go ahead and do that. I can also go ahead and change it to another type of chart. So maybe a tree map. The tree map, just the bigger the box, the higher the value. So quarter two, 43.9. So that's what we can do. So we can change it to another chart type and it will still incorporate the data for us and we'll be good to go. I'll go back to the regular clustered column here. Now I'll go ahead and switch the row and column data again here. I'd rather see this view. And now what if I add another application here? So what if I add another program? I could do that if I want to. It's not going to be automatically be displayed on the chart. So if I just put other in here, and for quarter one, we can see it's not being displayed on the chart. So if I want that information to be displayed on the chart, I have a couple of options. Notice when you click on the chart, it kind of highlights some of the different parts of the chart here, right? So we have the series, the legend, and the actual numerical values as well. I can see it's not including that new record. So what I can do is move my mouse right over here and I can drag to kind of display what I want to on the chart. So if I want to add that, include that new entry, we can see that it's been included here. What if I just want to focus on the first half? So quarter one and quarter two, here are the numbers for quarter two as well. So we can always feel free just to kind of move this around to kind of reshape the data that's being displayed on the actual chart. I'll simplify it. I'll just show quarter one and quarter two for all of those values there as well. Now, what else can I do with this chart? Well, I can move this chart to its own worksheet. So I'll click on chart design and I'll click on the move chart command here. Now I have two options. I can either move it to an existing sheet or I can move it to a new sheet. Well, I want to move it to the charts sheet here, which is right over here. And that way I can just have the chart on that sheet by itself. I can make it as big as I want to. and I'm good to go. I'll go ahead and press OK. And we can see it moved our chart to the charts worksheet. I'll go ahead and just resize it here. Now this is still tied to our data set. All right. I'll make this a little bigger. So it is still tied to our data set. So if I were to change any of the values on here, for example, for other, for quarter four, I'll change this to 80,000. Let's go back to our chart. Uh, that was quarter four. Let me go ahead and change quarter one instead. So as we can see, it significantly increases here. So we're still dynamically connected to that range of data on that particular sheet. And there we go. So that is our chart. Now there's another type of chart that we can use and that is called a sparkline going to put my spark line right over here on the consolidation sheet because what I'd like to do is get a little trend. So what is the trend in terms of cost for each software program across quarter one, two, three, and four? So if I were to try and draw a line that represents the trend here, we can see that we went up for software applications. We had an increase in quarter two decrease in quarter three, and a slight increase again in quarter four. So just a little trend line here, but that's not accurate. That's just my free hand. So I want the spark line to actually create that trend analysis for me. So we'll take a look at that in just a few. 
Let's insert our spark line to get a nice trend analysis to see how we're trending from quarter one to quarter four for our software applications program. If I click on the insert tab to the far right here, I have an entire command group just for spark lines. I can insert a line, spark line, visual, a column, or wind loss. Wind loss only has to do with positive or negative values, so they don't apply here. We'll start with a line visual, and we can convert it to a column visual later on. So Sparkline is just a mini chart that will appear right inside of a cell. So I'll go ahead and click on the line Sparkline here. And I like any dialog box that only asks me for two things. It's asking me for the location. So where do I want to place the actual spark line? I already have G4 selected. If I did not, I could have just clicked on it here. Now for my data range, I want to analyze the numbers, quarter one to quarter four for software applications. So I'll go ahead and highlight those numbers. And it's going to go ahead and give me the appropriate visual, unlike my freehand visual there. So the data range is B4 to E4, so quarter one, two, three, and four. Program costs for software applications. I want to place my spark line right here in cell G4. I'll go ahead and press OK. And there's a more accurate description. So sharp decline and a sharp, a sharp incline here as well. Now I like to make the column wider so I can really see that visual I can also make the row higher. So there we go. Now we get a spark line contextual tab as well. So once we have that selected, here's our spark line contextual tab. So we can do things like annotate the low point, the high point. We can change the style as well. And we can even convert it to a column. I'll go ahead and highlight the high point and the low point. So here's the high in quarter two, the low is in quarter three. And I'll go ahead and change the style here as well. Now, depending, if you change the cell color, then these styles will kind of look a little better. But here's my orange. So there's my trend as well. Now, what I can do, I don't have to create individual spark lines for each of my programs here. What I can do is I can grab the fill handle and I can pull this down and this will create the individual spark lines for me as well. So I'll go ahead and do that. And there we go. I'll just go ahead and make sure that all of the rows are high enough. So I'll change the row height to 28. And there we go. So we can see leadership, kind of sharp increase here. Looks like there was more interest in this particular program. So just based on the expenditures here, right? We can see in quarter four, generally there was less interest in our programs. We get that dip here for quarter four. So that is a spark line. That is how we are able to just display a trend analysis as opposed to a chart. We just have a simple visual right in a cell here as well. I'll go ahead and change this to a column visual. So I'll click on the spark line here and I'll change this to a column visual. Let's see what that looks like. So here's just a little column chart inside of each of our cells. Change the color. So there we go. So those are our spark lights. Thanks for watching. To earn certificates and watch our courses without ads, check out learnitanytime.com.